I look insane. It's fine. I know it. I acknowledge it. I apologize. Hello ladies, gents, and non-binary mates, and welcome back to Beauty in the Bookcase. Today we're going to be doing part two of my rating the top opening lines in literature history. So if you want to do your own version of this tier list, I'm going to leave it down in the description below. If you haven't seen my previous video, make sure to check it out. Originally I hadn't changed the names of the tiers, but I decided that I'm actually going to have them range from angelic noises to why? because I feel like that works. Um, I do want to change the middle tier name because it's just okay and I feel like it doesn't encompass the things that I kind of said for a lot of those books. So if you have any recommendations for what I could change that title to, let me know down in the comments below. And without further ado, let's get started. The first line for today actually comes from a uh, Toni Morrison book called Beloved. It's a pretty famous book. Um, and it is 124 was spiteful. I do feel like it is a little bit vague, which last time I said it's it's very hard for lines like that to really get my attention. Um, you know, I don't really feel drawn to anything that's too vague because it doesn't tell me anything about the story. However, I think in this case what Morrison does that's super, super interesting is, you know, we're already kind of getting a sense of our surroundings, you know, the, the life that our main character lives, right? So she is, I'm assuming, either in some type of apartment complex or, you know, within a neighborhood. Of course, buildings are, are numbered and perhaps she doesn't really know this person. Um, and that's why um, the main character refers to them by maybe their house number or maybe it's some other type of num numbering system and we're being told that they're spiteful but you know we don't know why and that, that already starts to set up a bit of interest a bit of intrigue a bit of mystery into what this plot could be with that in mind um for now i'm going to rank beloved in okay and what we did last time which i forgot to mention was i kind of just gave them an an initial score and then at the end I revised whether I wanted to move something up, move it down, or leave it as it was. Next up we have a translation. Beth Grossman translated the opening line of Don Quixote as somewhere in La Mancha, in a place whose name I do not care to remember, a gentleman lived not long ago. One of those who has a lance and ancient shield on a shelf and keeps a skinny nag and a greyhound for racing. Now right off the bat I think this line does a really fantastic job in establishing who our main character is. This is probably a smaller town, a smaller area where not a lot really happens. And then you have this character that greatly contrasts with that idea because, you know, we're being told, eh, this little town, you know, this place, I don't care to remember its name, it's not important. However, there was this character who's going to be our lead. So I think this is a really, really good job of telling us kind of like, yeah, the setting might be boring, but there's this person in this world that we're about to step into who's kind of not like everyone else. So with that, I will probably put Don Quixote in Love It. Up next, we have Albert Camus' The Stranger. Um, again, a translation by Stuart Gilbert. And the first line of that book is Mother Died Today. Now, again, uh, short and sweet lines, um, not necessarily a bad thing, I would say. I mean, as, as we've seen both in this video and the previous one, I think it's not about having a very complex opening line so much as a compelling opening line. Now, of course, this opening line clearly makes us feel for the main character. We don't know what the relationship is with their, their mother, but what we do know is that she's passed away and of course that instinctively as a reader sets off a bit of sorrow and a bit of empathy for our main character because he's suffered what most of us would consider quite a great loss. So I think that's definitely something that works well in establishing already you know it already establishes why we should care about this person right even if it's just on a very base level of we wouldn't want you know to obviously even think about losing our parents so we can't imagine the grief that they're going through and i think that's something really really clever that could probably be dismissed very easily you know kind of like okay whatever nothing original but again i don't think 
a great first line has to be brilliantly original. I think it just needs to be compelling and needs to tell me why should I care about this main character or the story and I think this does it really well. So for now I'm gonna put our friend Camus right next to Toni Morrison's Beloved. Up next is Hajin's Waiting. Every summer Lin Kong returned to Goose Village to divorce her wife Shuyu. Now that is interesting, right? So we, you know, get a bit of setting, which is always good, I think, you know, to know where we're supposed to be. But what's really interesting here, right, is that we get to know who two of our characters are. Um, we get Lin Kong and his wife Shuyu. But then we get the really interesting bit, which is that every year, every summer, you know, he goes back to divorce his wife. Now, of course, that's something that's gonna catch us off guard because we're like, what do you mean you have to divorce your wife more than once? Why do you have to do it every year? What does that even mean? And I think confusion can be a really, really, really good tool to effectively draw your reader in. Um, and I mean, it, it can also be very polarizing. I think, you know, in, in stories where you genuinely don't know what's going on, it's kind of very easy to to lose interest. So obviously it's it's our jobs as writers to consistently add details if we do want to continue to, you know, have some mystery in our story. You know, you need to leave those breadcrumbs and you need to give your readers something so that they're not just like, what is happening? So I think I'm actually going to put that up in Love It. So what I did last time was I completely avoided the top tier until the end. Um, just because I really wanted to make sure that whatever went up there was really deserving. So yes, for now it's just going to go right next to Don Quixote. Up next, Neuromancer by William Gibson. The sky up of the port was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. That's really interesting, of course, because yes, it is description, but it's very particular, right? We don't normally hear things described as the color of dead television like of a dead channel um so of course you know it's kind of like the idea of you know snow i think that's what they call it anyway like static um so that's a very clever way to get your readers attention because a it catches them off guard and b it makes them think because obviously like when i first read that i was like what does that even mean and then i was like well i guess static kind of like snow so it's probably you know quite a snowy day um where there's not a lot of visibility but instead of just being like it was a snowy day where there was not much visibility um gibson does something really interesting by kind of using a metaphor that we don't see very often or at least i haven't if you have definitely let me know um but yeah personally i've never heard you know this type of description used so i think it's really really clever and i think it just Daring to do something different is, is obviously quite challenging for anybody. So I think I'm going to have to put it into Love It. Although a part of me almost wants to put it up in Angelic Sounds already because it is so unique. So up next is my beloved Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, notes from the Underground, translated by Michael R. Katz. Um, I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. Now, usually... We want to like our main characters, obviously. You know, nobody wants to root for somebody who describes themselves as sick and spiteful. Um, granted, you know, we don't know what he exactly means by sick. He could mean literally physically ill. He probably means he's like messed up in the head. Obviously, it doesn't necessarily draw me to the character, right? It doesn't make me like them. Whereas describing yourself as spiteful kind of goes back to that Toni Morrison Whereas this one, our main character in first person immediately tells us like, you know, I might not be likable. And that's of course interesting because yes, you, you know, it's quite hard to root for a character who isn't 100%, you know, the best. But the reason why it works though is because we wanna know then why are you so angry? Why are you so embittered why are you so mad at the world what's made you so spiteful and that makes you want to keep reading even if you feel that you may not like this character 
you want to know why they are in the position that they're in. I definitely have to put my boy Dostoevsky up in Love It. Actually, I'm going to put it in okay for now. Up next, The Unnameable by Samuel Beckett. This was translated by Patrick Bowles. Where now? Who now? When now? So this is <laughs> classic Beckett. It's always very kind of dramatic. It's vague, right? I mean, I don't know anything about anything, right? I don't know. You know usually what we've been talking about, right, is that these opening lines give us details that make us interested. They tell us about our character. They tell us about the setting. They tell us something. And Becca just went like, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm going to start everything with questions. But more importantly, my character doesn't know anything either. So I think, I mean, that's definitely interesting because you do feel kind of a bond with the main character then because you're both kind of in the dark. And I think that's, of course, quite helpful. However, do I necessarily feel like I need to read this book? As somebody who enjoys Beckett, yes, but if I was unfamiliar with him and this was the first night line, um, I don't know, because the book is called The Unnameable, right? So kind of them not knowing anything about who they are or where they are or you know what's up next could very much play into you know the title do i love it do i feel a need to read this like find this book right now not really so i think for now my dear beckett uh i'm gonna put it in um you know like it could go either way up next is the making of americans by gertrude stein once an angry man dragged his father along the ground through his own orchard. Stop, cried the groaning old man at last. Stop, I did not drag my father beyond this tree. What? Now that is interesting. So again, we start off with an angry character who's dragging his father that does not make us like him at all. Um, I mean, we're interested because we want to know why this is happening, but then there's another layer of interest in that the, the old man who's being dragged says, I didn't drag my own father past this point. So it seems to be some type of family tradition, maybe, or, you know, it, it, it's very odd. And I think it catches our attention, like, um, with the waiting, because it's so odd. And we can't really connect to the experience. We can't necessarily relate to the experience. I mean, I can't. <laughs> if you do, please let me know. Um, but I think it's very, very interesting that we start off with clearly a very aggressive character that we won't necessarily like, but then we realize this is something that is just happens in this family. And I think that might both lead to in intrigue and it might make us hesitate in not wanting to like the person because perhaps their aggression and their behavior and their actions are absolutely based on the circumstances they were born into and that they grew up in. And I think that's really, really fascinating. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put Gertrude Stein over in... I think I'm going to put it in Love It. Yeah, I think it does something really, really interesting. Up next, The End of the Road by John Barth. In a sense, I am Jacob Horner. What? No! What? <laughs> this is interesting because, you know, is he say, is this actually the main character's name? And is he saying to an extent he is what people expect of him? Or is this somebody else? And he's just kind of saying like, in a way, I am like this other person. Um, I don't know how I feel about this, honestly. Um... Again, I mean, I think it's definitely interesting. I think my attention, it, it obviously, you know, it, it made me think, which is good. You always want, <laughs> you know, good books should always make you think. Um, however, is it enough to make me want to read the whole book? That's where I'm kind of like, I don't know. Because, 
again this could easily that is a mess why did i do that um sorry so i mean i don't know that it makes me want to necessarily read it to find out what he means um i mean i wouldn't say it leaves me going like why but it kind of just leaves me like okay um why should i care i think by having that in a sense it does kind of build a bit of interest and a bit of intrigue and, and makes it a little bit different from just being like this is my name and this is my story but I don't think it's enough personally to go out and buy this book so the end of the road you're going towards the end of the road <laughs> Richard Powers Galatea 2.2 it was like so but wasn't like, no god no god please no 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 this is obviously going on why i mean why not only why did you write this but also why should i care nothing about this like you know it was exactly like this except it was completely different and not like that at all um i mean i think it's it can work in like a comedy, you know, like Seth Rogen and um, I was about to say James Dean, James Franco. We are same, 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 but different, but still same. Huh? Why? Why? Like the fact that that goes into like one of the best lines. I don't know. Maybe it was a product of his time. Maybe it was the first time somebody opened a book. With a line like that, I don't know. I also don't care. Willem Gaddis, Jr. Money. In a voice that rustled. I mean, again, there's a bit of intrigue just because it's not something that I've heard before. But I, as I said earlier, I don't think we should base things so much on originality as we should base them on how genuinely effective they are and how they mat like what they managed to make us feel and this makes me feel confused but does not make me feel that i care enough to actually figure out what this is supposed to mean that's kind of the biggest thing that tends to draw me away from something and kind of put me off as if your opening line doesn't at least confuse me, which already tells me a bit about kind of like the style of the plot, maybe, then I don't really care. So I'm sorry, William Gaddis. I'm sure you are much better than I ever will be, but we're going on to why. Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. Okay. I mean, we start off establishing the character. We start off establishing an action that they're doing that's good obviously um obviously tells us about who this person is um that being said it's a very mundane kind of action and it doesn't kind of it doesn't really is establish that idea of you know how sometimes um books that start with every year we did this right like we had an example earlier like every summer he divorced his wife so the purpose of doing that is usually to tell your reader, but this year things are going to be different. This time something happened that altered the usual course of events. However, I think in this case, you know, because it's not been established that usually somebody else buys the flowers or, you know, that somebody else said that they would and then they backed out or because we don't know much right now, all we have to work with is Mrs. Dalloway said she was going to get the flowers herself. Yeah, I think there's definitely undertones that I could read into it. But again, if I have to sit there and try and flesh out a reason why I should care, uh, because it's not directly in front of me, I think that kind of makes things a bit more weak. So I'm going to have to put it in, um, you know, it could go either way. Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse-Five. All this happened more or less. 
is this book iconic is this book one of you know those books that everyone has or at least should read absolutely 100 percent is fauna good a genius absolutely couldn't agree more is this line boring absolutely couldn't agree more i mean it kind of has that vibe of galatea 2.2 it, it's basically saying almost the opposite, kind of like, it was exactly like this. this is, I'm about to tell you a series of events, which like, I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, that's that's the point of a book. Um, Yeah, as I was saying, boring, I don't care. Moving on, uh, good book, just not a great first line. Toni Morrison's Paradise. They shoot the white girl first. Say, ooh. Now that, again, is a way to do something simple, something short, but make it interesting, right? So obviously, this is implying that there's some type of violence. It's already keying us into something significant with the fact that it might be racially motivated. Um, you know, you're already, you know, thrown right into the action, which can sometimes be a bit jarring. But I think in this case, it works really well just because it immediately makes me care for someone. It awakens those emotions of concern, of empathy, of sympathy, um, of shock and horror. And I think that's really, really such a strong way to draw your reader in and make them interested in it. Of course, it establishes the plot brilliantly by being in the center of the action. And, you know, it kind of has one of those moments, those like saved by the bell moments of, you're probably wondering how I got here. And we're about to find out. So, Joni Morrison, Paradise, I'm putting that in, love it. Marcel Proust, Swan's Way. For a long time, I went to bed early. Now, this is an interesting one because it's very simple and I feel like a knee-jerk reaction might be like, okay, why should I care? Why is this interesting? However, I think it does something similar to um, the uh, mother who died line. I think it does a really, really, really good job of letting us feel sympathetic for this character because sure, it might just be, you know, a, a one of those things of like, well, you know, I work a lot, so... I go to bed early but to me i think there's a sorrow that reads in that line and i think it's obviously meant to i think it's meant to tell us that this behavior is potentially about to change of course so swan's way if i can find it yes there we go i'm gonna put it in love it i think it's really clever um up next is chromos by felipe alfa the moment one learns English, complications set in. It's interesting because as a person who did, you know, English is my second language, I feel like I have maybe experiences that somebody who obviously is born speaking English um, doesn't have. But I think anyone who's learned a foreign language and has then of course used it for work or, you know, for specific opportunities can kind of relate to the knowledge that like there's a lot of burden sometimes especially if you have you know family members or people around you who don't speak the language you kind of become the the default translator the default speaker in a lot of conversations i'm even i think even if i i didn't have these experiences i think there's something really interesting about telling your reader the second you learn a language some like difficulties come up um, because you want to know why, you know, what type of difficulties, you know, um, would I say, you know, angelic sounds? Probably not, but I'm going to put it in okay for now with potentially moving it up, moving it up later to love it. Anita Bruckner, the debut. Dr. Weiss of, at 40 knew that her life had been ruined by literature. The, the concept is literature has ruined this person's life. Um, but is it, you know, in an intellectual sense, like, is it because the people around her are not necessarily, you know, into reading and so she can't connect with people? Or is it the type of thing of like, well, she's had all these expectations set before her by these authors, 
I would assume, you know, particularly romance authors, you know, who build these very, very beautiful romances, but then it's like, that's not how life works. So it could be something like that. And I think that's really interesting because again, we get to know something about our character. Um, we get to know a lot of things actually, you know, their name, their age, um, and an interest that they have as well as, you know, their profession. So I think this is a really clever way of introducing us to our character while also forcing your reader to ask questions that they need feel the need to read on so that they can find the answers to it. And I think that's a great marker of a good opening line. You know, you want your reader to have questions because questions are the only reason we want to read on. So with that, I'm going to put the debut in... Okay. I'm going to put it in okay for now. Another, another one of my Russians, Vladimir Nabokov, Pale Fire. I was the shadow of the wax wing slain by the false azure in the window pane. So we have some rhyming, which can be good. It has rhyme and that can kind of take your reader out of things because, you know, if it's not necessarily a poetry book, then why are we rhyming things? And it, it's one of those things that feels like art made for artists as, as some, some call it. So it's kind of like this desire to to be kind of pretentious and dramatic <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with that it's just it can be a bit off-putting okay so it is a novel but it is presented as a 999 line poem <sighs> I don't know especially because I don't know I think if it's meant to be a novel then write it as a novel and if you want to write poetry then write a poem but while I think, you know, using a little bit of poetry here and there uh, within within literature, you know, things like where the Crawdads sing, where they have like a lot of poetry in it. I think it, I think if you're going to use it, then you need to give me a reason why it's there. Like, so for now, I'm going to have to put it in why. Um, up next, we have Their Eyes Were Watching God by... Um, Zora Neale Hurston, ships at a distance, heavy every man's wish on board. It's hard because I've read this book, so it's knowing the context. It's a book about slavery. You know, it's these people whose lives have been have been stolen and, you know, kind of their ability to choose for themselves and to have their own dreams and have their own hopes and, and kind of have control over the situation has been ripped from them and carried off in in the ship it's kind of like not so much the ship coming in but the ship leaving you and you knowing you know i've i'm never potentially going to go get to go back to where i came from and accomplish the things that i had planned for myself because somebody else decided that they got to pick for me um slavery not great but yeah i mean i think i think it is interesting because it's still quite poetic but i think it doesn't necessarily tell us much about the plot or anything so it's hard for me to rate this without being biased because I know what what's to come but I mean I think there's something really really poetic and beautiful about it that does draw me in without putting me off like the Nabokov but it is a little bit vague um so I'm gonna have to put it in okay with the potential of getting bumped down to um I'm sure y'all remember when I started filming the sun was probably still out well it's gone now because my phone has uh my storage has been full twice and it's just been annoying anyway it's been a day I did my eyeliner already sorry um we're gonna get through this <laughs> I have lost my patience and my will to live but we will get through this anyway um, up next is Edith Wharton's Ethan Frome. I had the story bit by bit from various people and as generally happens in such cases each time it was a different story. It's, it's good to come back to that one. <laughs> um, I think yeah I think this is really effective because 
Well, it does something quite similar to sort of simpler things that I wasn't crazy about. What it does that those um, other authors haven't accomplished is that even though, yes, it's saying like, there's the story that I'm about to tell you, it's effectively telling us something new and something different while also showing us something relatable, which is, you know, we all know that obviously everyone's perspective on events are, is going to be different. And so, you know, Wharton here does a great job of giving us something that we can immediately connect to and relate to so that we feel like we belong in this world that she's creating and, and we feel, in, you know, intrigued because we want to know what the truth with a capital T is, but we're also already being set up with maybe there isn't going to be a full 100% story because everyone's going to have their own version of, of events. So with that, it's definitely going to be um, up on Love It. Alphabetical Africa by Walter Abish. Ages ago, Alex, Alan, and Alva arrived at Antipes, and Alva allowing all, allowing anyone against Alex's admonition, against Alan's anger asser angry assertions, another African amusement. Anyhow, as all argued, an awesome African army assembled and arduously advanced against an African anthill, assiduously annihilating ant after ant, and afterwards, Alex astonishingly accuses Albert as also accepting Africa's antipodal and annexation. <sighs> that was a mouthful. I see what they were going for. I love the alliteration. I think it's incredibly clever. However, that's a mouthful to read. And because you're so focused on getting the words right and like kind of trying to get that rhythm of it just to fit, I can't tell you anything that I just read. Um, there's a lot of things about emotions and, and events happening and I think if it was written differently it would have drawn me in. To me it just felt really overwhelming and it kind of just, you know, kind of felt almost like panicky, like you have to keep going and going and going and going and going. And I'm gonna have to put it in why just because my brain is like, what's happening? The Voyage of the Dawn Treader by C.S. Lewis. There was a boy called Eustace Clarence Scrub and he almost deserved it. Okay, so at first, that first half, I was like, okay, whatever, we get it. You're starting off with the character's name. He says, says nothing. However, then there's that clever little twist of, and he almost deserved it, right? So that tells us, like, he's going to be an interesting character. Um, potentially, we're not going to like him. So I'm going to put it in okay. Um, the Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. He was an old man who fished alone in a skiff in the Gulf Stream, and he had gone 84 days now without taking a fish. Do I particularly care about a fisherman? No, I think, I feel like there could have been a little bit more done to emphasize those 84 days because I literally just, I kind of grazed over them. Um, and so it wasn't until like I was saying, oh, there's no sense of urgency. And I was like, wait, and I looked at it again and it did have those 84 days, but I feel like that's not the most important part of the sentence. So um, I don't really feel a need to invest myself in this character. So with that, I'm going to have to put it in um, The Crow Road by Ian M. Banks. It was the day my grandmother exploded. Are you related to Carl? <laughs> oh my god, if you haven't seen my video from last week, which I did, uh, the hundred year old man who climbed out the window and disappeared, Carl is the main character and he loves to blow up things, so there's my connection to this. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely immediately going to go on that love it tier, just for the fact that, again, it's unexpected. Um, it's gonna tell us, you know, that this is the specific day you're telling me why it's important um it tugs again at the heartstrings because we're both like amused confused and shocked but we also like want to comfort this person um but we also want to be nosy and know what happened what led up to like them exploding why did they explode how did they explode where is gamora yeah i'll do you one better who's gamora i'll do you one better why is Gamora? Again, there's a lot of questions immediately coming in and because it's so different, kind of like that necromancer um, opening line, it makes me want to read more because 
I didn't expect it, but it also wasn't like trying too hard. It just wanted to be clever and I mean, I almost a bit humorous because it's done so casually, right? Last but not least, Middlesex by Jeffrey Eugenides. I was born twice. First, as a baby girl on a remarkably smockless Detroit day in January of 1960, and then again as a teenage boy in an emergency room near Pitoski, Michigan in August of 1974. Um, I did cover this book already, so make sure to check that video out. I'll leave it in a card somewhere for for you to see. Um, yeah, I love, I love this book and I love this um, opening line. It's obviously to go on. Love it. But again, I think it does a great job of, of establishing who our character is going to be while also establishing the setting. And yeah, it just it's it's very cleverly written to to draw you in and, and have you asking all those questions. <sighs> Editing Maria here. I forgot to uh, move stuff into the angelic tier. So I've just redone that. And uh, here's a photo somewhere of what my actual ending results were like. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this and let me know in the comments below what choices you agree with, what you disagree with. Um, if you do make your own version of the tier list, definitely um, tag me on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter and let me see what you know your results were. Um, make sure to subscribe for more videos like these and I will be uploading a video on the book of unknown Americans next week so make sure you hit that notification bell so you know exactly when that video goes up so I will see you guys then Bye.